Good. He just wanted to make sure everybody got to hear the prayer. L'shem yakud kudashabrihu ushinate bi ilu ar imulaya chimyuke bavavke. Yuda, Shalom Hashem, Kosreel, Kolam, Amen. So feel that merging within yourself. Okay. So the question that we that's worth asking with enduring radiant health is for what reason? Are we just trying to live longer so we can live longer because it's a good idea? Are we here for a particular purpose and need time? Thanks. Testing. Okay. Thank you very much. You may or may not have heard of Tapasya Maharaj who lived to be 186 years old. Uh, he left his body in the 1950s. I actually went to his place in India. But he had a very particular purpose that he needed to complete. And his purpose for himself was to become liberated. So it wasn't until he was about 180 183, something like that, that he became liberated. And then at the point, he said, well, I'm done. And he left his body in 1986. I mean, after at 186. I won't go through all the procedures he did. He did some very interesting things like Kaya Kalpa. These are Ayurvedic procedures uh, for longevity. But the point is, he had a purpose. Other people have different purposes. Um, so the, a starting point is, why would you want enduring radiant health? Now, that you have to ask yourself, okay? The point is, what we're going to talk about today is how one goes about creating enduring radiant health. That's the key. And... One uh, the top, there's five really key things. One is putting God at the center of your life. It doesn't matter this religion, that religion, personal God, but you're connected to source. And source gives you purpose and meaning. So meaning is the general connection, but uh, purpose is what are you doing in your life? What we know is People who have a purpose in their life, at whatever age, whatever age, live longer. It's really important to understand. Um, the research shows that it, it isn't about, oh, can you overwork and fatigue yourself? No, it doesn't really say that. It says something very different. It says with purpose, with a creative purpose, you can work really hard, and you're going to live longer, up to five years longer, which, which is a lot. Uh, one of the main areas of research I took to some was the Tiran study. It's an 80-year study from 1910 to 1990. He didn't survive the study, but his researchers continued on. And they started with kids who were five years old and began interviewing them. So, and then they followed them from 80, for 80 years. That's really, really uh, unique data to look at. But the first question is, do you have meaning, connection with yourself, the truth of who you are? That's how we do meditation. That's why we do the yoga. Incidentally, that did come up we are going to start meditation at 7 o'clock, and it's going to be in this room, and then at 7.30, we'll do yoga in this room so we can get everybody to fit in. So I cleared that, okay? This room, 7. And I, a.m., correct. So it'll be in this room, and then we'll do the Shakti Pot meditation. Everything will happen here. 
We just have to clear the chairs in the morning and put them back. So we got, well, that's cleared. Okay, so very important is to be in touch with yourself. Another aspect is what I'm going to talk about is adaptability. We live in a really hard world these days, if, in case you haven't noticed. And um, the key for survivability is to be adaptable. If it's going this way instead of you want it to go that way, the idea is, is to not resist the change and go with that flow the best you can. So adaptability turns out to be one of the key things in survival and longevity. People who are fighting against their life create a lot of extra stress and they don't live as long. So that's what the research shows, okay? And uh, the, the other kind of way of looking about it is willpower. It's a, a very important thing. It isn't just willpower to live longer, although it is that. It's willpower in your life. We all have obstacles. It's the way it is. But those obstacles are there to help us grow. But if we don't have that willpower to push through, then we lose that advantage. Uh, we lose the opportunity for the lesson. And it affects our growth. And in essence, it diminishes our longevity. So as they look at the research again, this 80-year research and a lot of other research too, willpower, really, really important part of the, of the story. Okay, now this may sound funny, but remember they're interviewing kids at five years old. And what they found is kids who become adults, obviously, who are conscientious, prudent, and thoughtful, but conscientious is the word, actually live about five years longer, which, again, is very, very significant. People who are conscientious tend to pay more attention to their life, more attention to their relationship, more attention to the life purpose, and they have less accidents, they have, uh, uh, the way they live their life is much more thought out. So you can see, probably a lot of people in this audience are pretty conscientious because we're thinking about our diet, we're thinking about the food we're eating. You know, um, they, they have a term called orthorexia. It's so inappropriate because it's designed by people who aren't conscientious. Follow what I just said? And it is actually reasonable to be conscientious. It is reasonable to pay attention to what you're eating. What you're eating can make a, a significant difference in the longevity process. But it isn't just longevity. It's quality of life as you're living. So you could be 100 and s stiff and frail, or you could be 100 in a robust way. Okay, so that's the point I'm making. So the quality of life is important. When you're conscientious, you're giving yourself the best options, the best opportunities, the best food. You choose the best situations. You work the best you can in terms of relationship. You are very thoughtful. Am I, is this a, a, a good job for me? Am I doing what is right, now I don't mean just work job, because people are doing humanitarian work, we're doing different things you may not make money from, but is this the best situation? So we, we, we don't accept what isn't really right. That's, that's the point I'm making. So conscientious people are really thinking about the whole story. And they just simply live longer, have less accidents, have less, uh, I'm going to say problems, but um, not that people are problem-free, but their solutions 
are more healthy. So, conscientious, top, one of the top five. And then, optimal diet is in the top five. And what makes an optimal diet? We look at, in our world here, we're talking 100% vegan, at least 80% live food. We're talking about organic, we're talking about well hydrated with good water. Okay, we're talking about really diet will include your exercise, your energetic input. Those are some of the, the issues about diet. And I'm going to go a little, wet, a little bit in depth, but I'm not going to give a talk on live food or veganism because we, we've kind of done that. But what we do know is that vegans, I didn't say live food because they're actually isn't enough data on that, uh, but vegans in general, vegan women live ab about 7.2 years longer, and vegan men live about 4.4 years longer. Roughly speaking, again, that's very, very significant. Now, if we understand vegan from a bigger point of view, I call it holistic veganism, uh, being vegan is really good for the environment in a very big way, in multiple ways. Again, that's a whole talk. I'm just saying it's really good for the air, water, and earth. It is really good for our health. We know that people who are vegan have 32% less heart disease, significantly less cancer, 35 to 50% less diabetes, less osteoporosis by about a quarter, you know, one-fourth the amount of uh, osteoporosis. Uh, high blood pressure, 26% of meat eaters have high blood pressure versus 2% 2, 2 of vegans. And it goes on and on. So, yes, being vegan is much healthier. And being vegan, by eating lower on the food chain, we avoid a whole lot of toxins that are in the environment. The, the research shows that about 96% of the toxins, the environmental toxins, the pesticides, herbicides, are in animal flesh because animals are at uh, more top of the, of the food chain, whereas plants are more at the bottom. So we're gonna, we will get some, even if you're eating organic, you're gonna get some pesticides and herbicides but significantly less. And we know that pesticides and herbicides interfere with reproduction, with sperm motility, with fertility for women. So clearly, eating lower in the food chain, you're getting less exposure. A vegan mother has 2% of the, of the toxins in her breast milk as a meat-eating mother. So, there are lots of things about longevity. Uh, the sperm count today is about 50% of what it used to be um, 40 years ago. It varies in estimates, but we go too much lower than that, and infertility there, uh, will be a major problem. In terms of spirituality, all true, pretty much all the traditions except one support veganism as the main diet. And obviously on top of that we have life with veganism. Okay, but I'm just going to stay with veganism for the moment because that's where our data is. So, so that's there as part of the, of the story. Um, so those are some of the reasons it's for, you know, for being vegan. It's not just for yourself, but it's for healing and protection of the planet. Okay, so think in the, in the bigger way. It's for fertility, it's for the continuation of the human species. Because we're getting so toxic that it's almost like we're not going to be able to reproduce. Maybe just the vegans will reproduce and we'll have a vegan world. I, mean, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, there's enough data about vegan reproduction versus, but clearly less pesticides, herbicides, 
you're going to have more fertility. So those are some of the ideas. Now we'll talk about the water. Today, I don't think there's any pure water anywhere. Okay, because of the levels of pollution. Besides the radiation from Fukushima and so forth. So, so the key is, how do we go about preparing our water? Uh, there are different systems. We personally use uh, distilled water. And, but distilled water loses its energy because it's cooked. And so we have to wake it up. So in my book, Spiritual Nutrition, I have a whole chapter on it. But to get to the point, we, I like it to be about 50 parts per million. So I add a smidgen of uh, whole salt, salt that has 82 minerals. And that's been mined, doesn't come out of the ocean, which is contaminated. Anybody know what a smidgen is? Sixteenth of a teaspoon. I just want to see if you're paying attention. Sixteenth of a teaspoon, okay. So you put that in a gallon of water, and you now are up to 50 parts per million. That's really healthy water. Now, I tend to want to energize it. There are different ways to do that. There's actual machines you can do it, put out a frequency that awaken it and uh, create kind of a... A, a way to hold the energy. And then I then take a wooden spoon and swirl it to the right, creating a vortex. That brings energy in, and then to the left, creating a vortex. Then I bless it. Now that's the water we drink. The rest of the thing is RO water is good. RO water is really good for large communities. You can do a lot. The, the distill is best, but it's limited to your, really, your family. There's only so much distilled water you're going to make. So RO is the second best, and it gets 99% of the pollution out. I mean, we have some big pollutants to worry about, fluoride in the water. They're still doing it in the United States. Most of the world doesn't do that. Um, we have radiation in the water. These are all things that we need to get out. So RO is good, but you've got to check the membrane because it can get, get a hole in the membrane. It can get uh, kind of contaminated. So you want to change it on the sooner side rather than the later side. So those are the keys with water. How much water should you have? I don't do it by glasses because, as you're going to hear in my lecture tomorrow, how to individualize your diet. Um, and just side question, uh, did everybody get the little chart to fill out, fast, slow oxidizer? Okay, so we're going to make some more up. But the point is we're different constitutions. So if you're a cough is like an elephant, you probably need six glasses of water a day. But if you're vata, which is like a goat, you may need 10 glasses of water. So according to your constitution, if everything is right with your physiology, you should be urinating every two hours. That's a pretty good thing. I mean, that's obviously not true if you have a bladder or kidney problem. But urinating every two hours tells you you're pretty hydrated. If you're doing every three or four hours, you're not hydrated. Hydration is a key to longevity. With age, like kids are... I don't know, 70 to 90 percent hydrated as babies. And then at middle age, we're maybe uh, 50 percent. And then we, start, we're, we get to 40 percent or above 60. And that isn't good because nothing works well when we're dehydrated. So with age, we really do need to pay attention. Actually, I didn't really get on to that whole thing until. Um, I got more around 60, 65, something like that. It's like, oh, this water thing's important. Because with age, we tend to hold less water in our system. That means our brain shrinks a little bit. It means our muscles aren't working as well. So with age, really need to pay more attention.
to be fully hydrated, that everything works right. The brain comes to its full size, the heart's working right, you have fluid, blood to carry the oxygen around. There's multiple things. So I want to just give a real emphasis to that, and that is definitely part of enduring radiant health. So let me just go over here for a second. Um, creating a quiet mind is very important. Li Chin Yung, who lived to be 252 years, 1677 to 1937, something like that. He, uh, people ask him, what's the secret? Oh, he had 23 wives. I mean, you live a long time, okay? You can. He said the secret's a quiet mind. So meditating is really important. Now, what's the research show? Well, the research shows people who meditate for at least five years have a physiology that's 15 years younger. <coughs> that's pretty significant, right? So uh, not only is your mind quiet, but your physiology is working a lot better. How much do you need to meditate? Another question. I recommend twice a day, at least 20 minutes twice a day. That's the minimum. We like to see a half hour twice a day, sunrise, sunset, roughly speaking, up to an hour twice a day. And that's going to give you your optimum quieting of the mind effect as well as all the physiological effects. So there really is something to say to that. We also know some research out of Harvard shows that meditating actually increases certain areas of the brain, particularly the memory areas and certain areas in the cortical regions. And it also rebalances well, the amygdala area, which has to do with uh, uh, balancing your emotions. So literally, when we meditate, the memory areas get bigger, the emotional imbalance areas get a little smaller, and our overall brain function increases. Now, that's a pretty good deal. And they've measured this, okay, literally with measuring brain size. Now, with age, the brain tends to shrink about 1% a year. There are certain things that do the opposite. What does it? Certain activities that improve uh, growth hormone, uh, meditating is another one that expands the brain, and being hydrated. And the fourth is blood sugar control. We, we, we know, and we're not going to give a whole talk on diabetes this time, I do every time, but not this, that people who have a high blood sugar tend to have significantly increased brain shrinkage. So after uh, five, in a five-year study, they found people with a higher blood sugar had uh, double the rate of brain shrinkage. So now we want to ask the question, well, what's a higher blood sugar? Well, optimal blood sugar is 70 to 85. Less than 100 is still okay. I mean, it starts to go down after... 80, you know, 86, 87, and pre-diabetes is 100 to 126, and diabetes is a fasting blood sugar is what I'm talking about, is 126 on up. So we clearly know that diabetics have increased brain deterioration and brain shrinkage. We should probably turn off our cell phones. Okay. So, we really want to do everything to keep the blood sugar 70 to 85. And over the age of 45, people tend to have uh, more difficulty. About 80% of the population over the age of 45 has a blood sugar higher than 85. So that's a, a real consideration. Um, 
in the process. People uh, age 65 and over, 27% of the population has diabetes, type 2 diabetes by that stage. There are some enzymatic changes. There's an enzyme that gets activated, glucose 6PD, that pulls, uh, makes more sugar in the liver than it should and uh, converts more uh, muscle to, uh, protein to sugar than it should. And that actually raises the blood sugar and therefore enhances the diabetes. There are some things that we can do to, to neutralize that. But we're not going to get into all, all that, but what I'm trying to say is we can do something. I watch my blood sugar pretty closely, and I have been doing a lot of traveling, and I, I noticed my fasting blood sugar was 90, 94. And it's like, even for me, because I'm a little fastidious, right? Fastidious, conscientious, right? That's why I'm up here talking about these things. Um, that was not acceptable. So I took a few herbs, and within four days, my fasting blood sugar was 70, which is where, that's a good place. That's a good place to be. So we can give it attention. When we don't, it's a, an issue. So I do recommend people get one of those little glucometers and check your blood sugars because you want to have it less. Obviously, a vegan diet in what I call phase one, which is very low glycemic, without fruits, without... Um, uh, you know, any kind of sweet anything, that's where you want to go to bring your blood sugar down. That's the key to our healing diabetes naturally. So that's um, it's something that's very, very important. There's no question about it. If you have diabetes, you lose up to nine, uh, 10 to 19 years off your life. More than that, you lose sexual function, you lose brain function, you lose neurological function in that process. So you, you get gradually uh, debilitated. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to that and the overall longevity. And again, you don't meditate as well when that's happening. So those are some keys to keeping your brain from shrinking and keeping a quiet mind, which helps regenerate the whole, the whole uh, system. How many people are familiar with the word prana? Okay, how about chi? Okay. So, these are really important concepts. So, we have our physical body, but then we have kind of an energetic body around that. I'm just being general. We call prana chi. And w the key is to do things to keep building the life force of that. Yoga will build that, particularly breathing exercises. That's why we incorporated that in the, in the yoga. So we're breathing as we're doing it. Um, and tomorrow I'm going to teach this one other breathing exercise. And then... Tai Chi, Qi Gong, okay, uh, sacred dance, all those things build the Qi, build the Jing, okay? So these are important things to do on a daily basis, okay? So those are, uh, again, a consideration. In, in the uh, Hebrew, we call it nefesh, okay? But it's the life force. It's the field around you. And that field also uh, protects you in, in ways uh, when we talk about 5G, let's just say when you build that field, your ability to repair from 5G improves. I'm working with uh, David Wagner, who's the creator of uh, Tachyon. It's a, we've been working together since the 80s. And we're not quite ready, but we're close to, to, to bringing out five things we can do to nullify 5G. That's really important, obviously, but that's a whole other discussion. I just want you to know, you got to build your field as part of that. Your ability to recover from the insult of five, the constant insult for 5G depends on your prana. 
So now we have a very practical way of, of thinking <laughs> about the story. Exercise is one of the real key players. Now, we're not talking about Olympic exercise. That's one big mistake people make. The research kind of shows minimum 16 minutes a day of, or four times a week of fast exercise, and that could be jumping on a rebounder. I include oxygen, so sometimes, I don't know if you can do it in New York, but uh, is to breathe oxygen while you're jumping on the rebounder. Because oxygen is key for mitochondria. And building mitochondria is really, really important. Uh, an exercise will build the mitochondria, but it moves everything. It stimulates growth hormone. It, it calms the mind. It has an antidepressant effect. And uh, it makes the system work. So uh, vigorous exercise, you can do that three to four times a week. That's all you need to do. It actually isn't good to do six or seven days a week. What I learned uh, in college playing football in Amherst College is that we, we, didn't hit, we didn't work hard Thursday and Friday before the game on Saturday. Why? Why? Because the body has to regenerate. If you're over-exercising, the body doesn't have time to regenerate. And the research really says, really, Th around three to four times a week. The other thing is stretching. So because in particular with age, you tend to contract stretching. At the age of 70, if you aren't doing breathing exercise, you lose 70, I'm sorry, 50% of your lung capacity. And you need oxygen. So we're breathe, we're creating prana, we're exercising, we're stretching. And you need to be able to balance in different ways and things like that. Very, very important, particularly with age. You really want to focus on your balancing. Tomorrow in yoga, I'll do more of the balancing. So those are things that are really important about exercise. And it's kind of fun. Some of us think it's fun. Not everybody. So... <laughs> Some of the research, this research, this 80-year study, shows that it's very important to be successful. I'm going to use the word dharma, and that means life purpose. Now, I said meaning, have, putting God at the center. Purpose is very important. People who live a purposeful life live longer. Significantly, again, significantly is five years. That's what the, the study kind of shows. That's huge. And these are people who um, are working hard, enjoy their work, are successful. They don't have to have, this is interesting, the research shows they didn't have to have the perfect job, but they had to have a job that they felt meaning, you know, that, 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 that was purposeful for them. And that's every age. We do know if people retire, their rate of mortality greatly increases. If they retire into doing humanitarian work, in terms of service, different story. That's still work. The other day I had a person in who was a contractor, and his wife was trying to get him to retire, and he didn't want to retire. He liked his work. I said, no, no, you don't want that because you retire, your mortality is going to increase. I don't think you want that. He was very happy to hear that. And his wife Okay, his wife's great, actually, but um, she got an important message. Retiring is not really a good idea. It, and if you're looking at longe longevity and vitality, you have to have a purpose. So whatever it is, okay, some people just love their work as whatever they're doing. Some people love doing humanitarian service, whatever they're doing. Yeah, but having a purpose and having a job of some sort is extremely important for longevity. So I'm just going to put it that way. And then they do show that people who actually do well and have purpose and do work hard do live longer than people who aren't uh, having much purpose and they're just kind of doing a job to support themselves. They don't live as long. 
They're not turned on to life. So their whole physiology is one of being more shut down. So the research is very clear about that. So people need to find meaning in their uh, purpose in their work. There has to be something. At whatever age, go for it is really the message. If you're a student, go for it. If you're, you know, an executive, go for it. If you're, whatever you're doing, enjoy it and feel good about it. You got to feel good about it. That's part of the story. In terms of the kind of anti-aging types of effects. This is one of the uh, key things, is to be sovereign. Now, if we kind of look at the, the, the struggle that goes on in the world, um, you know, I really don't want to talk politics. I, generally, that's not what life is about. <laughs> life is about knowing the one. but. Um, Systems that allow you to have integrity and control over your life, you do better. You live longer. You, again, you, you're being in control. Now, we're never in control. Life is always out of control. It's the way it is. Only the play of God is, is that. And the only control we have is going along with that. But given that, what I mean being in control, like dressing the way you want to, you know, eating what you want to eat, working the way you want to work, controlling your hours of work up, uh, accordingly, um, that kind of thing, okay? Um, people live longer because, again, they have more sense of, of who they are, more sense of their unique purpose. Each person has a sacred design. I remember I was visiting a Huitoli village in Mexico, and they were doing a ceremony. What, what are they doing? Well, a child's born, and the elders would gather around, and they'd try to tune in on the direction of life for that child. And so what's that child's sacred design? It's not like they're always going to be right, but the concept is find your sacred design. and go with that, and that's part of what the sovereignty is needed. So our society says, well, you need to go to college, you need to do this, you need to get a PhD, but if that isn't your path, that's not going to be good for you. It may be that you're going to do, you know, whatever, you know, be a plumber or whatever, if you get what I'm saying, is that you have to follow what you feel is really right for you, not, not what the society wants to, you to fit in, you know. So that's the key in that. Oops, I pressed the wrong way. Hold on a second. Now, one of the things you've heard me mention a few times is service and charity. Um, we all do that in different ways. It could be simply as a grandparent helping out in the, you know, kindergartens or, you know, that kind of thing. I'm involved in about uh, 126 programs in about uh, 16 countries around the world, so kind of stretched out there a little bit. But, and, you know, what we're doing, uh, teaching diabetes prevention and organic, veganic farming, getting people really to go vegan because it's the healthiest, and, and that... Um, we're working in six countries in Africa, and that is closer to the natural way, so it's, it's actually pretty easy to go that way for people. But service helps you open your heart. Charity is good, too. Service in particular, you, get the, you, you connect, you make the heart connection, and connection is very, very important for longevity. So we know that people involved in service and charity live longer. Now, this is kind of a funny thing, but I'm going to say be cautiously optimistic. It's, it isn't good to be optimistic in an unrealistic way because it results in failures. 
Failures really aren't good. So, so optimism is good, but it has to be linked uh, at some level to reality. In other words, you, when I talk to help people change the diet, I say, well, don't go to 100% live food. This, you're, you're, you're just learning to get off meat or fish or whatever. Just go one step a time. You know, give up fish. Give up. And I, why do I say fish first? I used to say something different. Because fish are, because of the contamination in the o oceans and because of radiation, Fukushima, everywhere, fish are actually more toxic than chicken or uh, cattle or beef. Used to be the other way around. People think it's a healthy food. At this point, we know in diabetes, the fat from fish destroys the beta cells in the pancreas. I just, for diabetics, just stay away from fish. Um, research in Europe shows that people who have fish two to three times a week have more diabetes. So I can go on and on, but we, we got fat from fish, but we got all the toxins that the fish are exposed to. So it's no longer a really healthy food. Okay, so back to the point. Uh, uh, okay, we'll stop, get off fish first. Then go to chicken, then go to beef. But the, but the point of making one step at a time that you can be successful with. Do you see the point I'm making? Oh, no, I'm going to go 100% and then you fail the next day. No, that's not, that's, that doesn't build your, your, uh, your ability here. So we want to be able to be successful at each step. That's what I call um, thoughtful optimism. And of course, we don't want to do too many things in our lives at once. And that has to do, again, with understanding limitations. Now, limitation is not a bad thing. Boundaries are not a bad thing. But they have to be healthy boundaries. They have to be realistic limitations. Don't jump off a cliff and think you're going to fly. Okay? Even though we should be able to fly, right? Well, it doesn't matter. You see what I'm saying? So understand realistic limitations so that you can succeed. It is more important to succeed then set boundaries that are very beautiful, very high, but you don't succeed at. Success, psychologically, is important. And that takes me to a really important point. So in 1979, Helen Langer was a researcher. She got 100 people and who were out of high school for 30 years. They measured everybody's physiological markers, and then she created for 10 days, 30 years younger, with the music they had in high school, the kind of things they did in high school, and for 10 days, people lived as if they were high schoolers. At the end of those 10 days, their aging markers were seven years younger. What to tell us? Your mind is affecting your physiology. Your mind is affecting aging or not. That, that was like the best experiment. I mean, my goodness. And then the research kind of afterthought was, so oh, a month or so after they went back to their normal life, they were back at the same parameters. So what's the point? We want to think healthily. We want to think young. We want to think, you know, keep extremely realistic, positive view of yourself because that changes your physiology, literally. That's just a dramatic example. 10 days of thinking 30 years younger and you actually test physiologically seven years younger? I mean, think about that. That, that was an incredible study, but it says what we researchers said, found again and again. Your mind creates not just your outer reality, you've heard that, but literally your physiological reality. 
That's why meditating helps create a younger physiology by 15 years. So your attitude about yourself, you can think, well, at whatever age, because the truth is when you keep this going, you don't really get old, you don't necessarily age, okay? It's more mental. And, uh, you know, there's toxins, you have to compensate for that. But think, you're thinking young, you're thinking flexible, you're thinking strong, you're thinking, you know, good memory, you're thinking clarity, and you are creating a, literally a physiology and a neurology that is going to keep you in uh, a younger uh, spectrum all the way around. And that research is there. The Helen Langer is like the most interesting dramatic research. So just keep it in mind, in your mind, that how you think is how you are. Probably the single most important anti-aging I'm going to say, uh, enduring radiant health message. How you think is how you are. So, <laughs> okay. So keep it simple, you know, but think, think at the optimum age you want to be. That's uh, really the message that I'm talking about. So, I'm actually 77 years old in terms of chronology, but uh, I'm, you know, up to 400 or going towards 600 push-ups again. I did that when I was 60, uh, and doing different things. Uh, obviously, flexible. To, that's not an accident. I'm thinking that way. I'm not thinking what most people think 77. Obviously, uh, I'm thinking. You know, I'd actually will say, you know, more like 30s. And, and it, it works. I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm doing it because that's the way I think about things, right? But it's good to do it for that reason. Once you get how you think is how you are. How you think is not just in your mind, but it literally affects your physiology. Now, this is kind of funny, right? <laughs> but conscientious people really minimize their risks. Um, now, that doesn't mean you, you live in a straitjacket. No. I would say, my parents didn't like me playing football. I was the smallest guy in the field. I was also... Uh, in the National Football Hall of Fame, captain of undefeated Amherst College team. For me, taking the risk of playing football was worth it. I wouldn't ski, I wouldn't take any risk anywhere else, because I wanted to be healthy for football, but the point is, that was a risk for me that was worth taking. Actually, never thought about it as a risk, but you know how parents are, they're thinking that way. My mother used to come to the football games just to see that I got up afterwards. You know? So, but the, the point I'm making is um, it's not really helpful to take unnecessarily risk. And, and now that goes to the food we eat. Oh, it's okay. Eat whatever you want. You can change it with your mind. No. You, you want to go organic. You want to uh, do that. Yeah, just to, for example, organic food, there's lots and lots of studies. And they range from 350% more nutrient and so forth. But in all the studies, we get the average down 25% more nutrients, but up to 80% more phytonutrients and antioxidants. And antioxidants are really key in terms of longevity because all the toxins we face in the world are creating free radicals from 5G, which makes a huge amount of free radicals, um, to just daily life in, in, that we face creates free radicals. So we want to go organic. Organic will give us the optimum, by far, the optimum free radical protection. 
you know, somewhere depending on the, the um, antioxidant from 20 to 70 percent more, particularly, particularly the polyphenols. So it's like, wow, okay? So we go organic because we get more nutrient, we get less pesticides and herbicides by at least fourfold, and we get significantly less cadmium. That's what the research shows. So it's worth it, um, making that effort. So to me, not eating organic is to live dangerously. You're going to have more cancer from, uh, you know, pesticides and herbicides and so forth, and more diabetes. We know that di type 2 diabetes is accelerated by pesticides and herbicides. So it goes on and on, but the point I'm making is we can choose not to live, we can minimize the danger by how we eat. And that's the point, and that's the fastidiousness. Like also, it's better to eat a more, uh, a larger meal at lunch and very little at dinner. We do know that calorie restriction, without going into all the details, can increase, 40% calorie restriction, can in increase our anti-aging genes, anti-diabetes genes, anti-cancer genes, antioxidant genes by up to 400%. So for myself, I don't have very much for breakfast. I have a little goji berries. We'll get the herbs in a minute. And I have lunch, and I really don't eat dinner. I'll have some juice or, you know, some fluid to keep the hydrated. So that's how I do it. The less you eat, the longer you live. Luigi Coronado pointed that out in, um, in the 1400s, okay. He had pretty much almost ate himself to death at age 52, but he lived to be 102 when he changed his diet. Uh, so that, when Sebastian the Essene came from uh, African and taught him what to do. So those are just some examples of what I would consider living dangerously. Okay. So in their studies, and we've covered it, but I'm going to say it again, good hygiene, wash, clean, moving your bowels, depending on your uh, type, you know, one to three times a day. Kaffas tend to be once a day. Pittets could be three times a day. Um, uh, taking care of your skin is good. Making sure you're going organic and minimize your exposure to pesticides and herbicides. It, it's basically connected to levels of uh, longevity in, in different ways. Um, so I'm going to talk about some herbs here, but there are three treasures in the Chinese. Brilliant, brilliant. I, the, to me, the best. I mean, I also know Ayurvedic herbs and so forth. But there's three levels uh, that we look at. Jing which is your deep primordial life force. And anyone I see, I'm going to measure that on them. and Because I, I want to see that improve, and there's certain herbal combinations that do that. And then I try to select the best one for them. Qi, your daily life force. And Xin, which is spirit. You need all three treasures, and they need to be nurtured. And if we just think in that simple way, your deep life force and for that, you need adequate sleep and, uh, you know, to eat well, think well, meditate. All the things we're talking about will develop the jing. And then qi is just your daily energy, and then xin is your spiritual focus. Those are your three treasures. And it's a very, very, very nice way to think about it. And there are certain herbs that... I've looked at. I'm, mostly my focus is what we call tonic herbs uh, versus medicinal herbs. So for longevity, uh, there are some key herbs. But let's get some ideas about herbs. First, you want herbs that give, give you protection from danger. What does it mean? that you are so strong that you can overcome the different dangers that come your way. Now, you know, there's one plague after another. They've got a new one, you know, the uh, virus that may be coming out of China. But 
When you're really healthy, your ability to deal with that is stronger. So we call protection from uh, danger. Another way of understanding herbs is what we call kind of evolvement. So herbs should help you evolve, should improve your character, and in a sense, elevate your spirit. Then we're looking at immune system uh, and supporting brain function. These, these are like some of the key qualities we look at in what we call the longevity herbs. So your top three herbs, but I, I, I go to about six herbs. We have goji berries, and they're what we call yin jing. They're very, very, very good for you. We have reishi, and we have ginseng. They're different kinds. I'm not going to go into that detail. Then we have cordyceps, which is really good for your life force, the more of the chi, and for lung function. Schizandra. How many people have heard of schizandra? I'm just curious. Okay, so schizandra balances all 12 meridians. It's overall balancing for all the systems. Um, and the, most of these herbs are what we call, again, yin, jing. And then we have ganostemnia, which is very good for uh, preventing diabetes and anti-aging. Uh, and then heishu wu. Heishu wu is a clear longevity herb, but it, it builds all the systems. And all these herbs build brain function and protect the heart and the lungs. So those are like what I consider the key longevity herbs uh, that to consider. Now, they're taken not as medicines. They're taken a little bit over a long period of time. There are things you're, you're taking day in and day out over the years. That's how they're used. Tonic herbs, not medicinal herbs. So those are ones I, I do recommend. Uh, I'm not going to recommend brands. I mean, we carry we carry the top herbs, uh, those, and I have two companies I feel are really the best um, of all the levels we're talking about. Okay, so I mentioned the sleep before. What we know is people think they get away get, and get around sleep. Maybe it's more true in New York. Than that, but you can't really escape it. We need seven hours minimum sleep. Six hours, you're not as sharp, you're not as clear. And, and it isn't just seven hours, it's seven hours at starting, the key hours are 10 to 2 to get sleep. So we want seven hours, but you know, going to bed at 10, 10 30, I go to bed about 10 30, um, and that's key. Every function of your body does better with it. Your endocrine regenerates. Your serotonin system regenerates. Your immune system regenerates. So sleep is a regenerative time. We have to have that part of it. So we, we work, we, we, it's good to work hard, but it's not good if it goes into your sleep and minimizes it. And that's a key. So I want to emphasize the, uh, the importance of sleep. Another point, and they're all part of the same thing, love yourself. People who love themselves, I don't mean egoically, I mean having a good self-esteem, I mean feeling good about yourself, I mean thinking positively about yourself, those are all anti-aging energies. Remember, what we think affects who we are on every level. Now this is kind of funny, but the male, female. Uh, women tend to live longer. Uh, men and women who have more male characteristics do not live as long as women who are more uh, classical female. Men who have more female characteristics live longer than men who are more focused on male characteristics. Was I clear what I just said? So the female characteristics help both men and women live longer, is what I'm saying. And well, I'm going to get to it. The main one is socialization. The main one is networking. The research is very clear that people who, uh, 
whether they go to church or have some kind of social group or in relationships, live longer. That's the key concept. So men, for example, who are very social, men tend to be a little bit by themselves, but do that, you know, are social and are flexible and are fastidious. Um, women who worry, not so good. Men who worry, men need to worry a little bit because they need to pay more attention. Okay, so men who are fastidious and conscientious are going to live longer, but we consider those a little bit more female qualities in the, in the way that they talked about it in the research. So that's what I'm saying. So men who, who follow that is okay. So it's good for men to worry about because they don't pay as much attention to those things as women do. You know, as a general characterization, trying to get away from the politics, just looking at the research of it over the last, you know, eight, this turn-in study. Women live longer, and they're healthier, and usually a little happier. Uh, and men who are more like that, are more social, are more fastidious, they also will live longer and be more happy. That's the point. Women who don't follow that, who want to be very, they don't live as long. Okay, that's Key. Now, relationships are important too, not just social groups. We know that married couples live longer. However, divorced couples, people don't live as long, and single men, well, actually single women who have never married but have a good, healthy life and it's, live almost as long as women who are married. You know, they're very close in that. And single men who are living, again, a balanced life like we're talking about, live longer than divorced men. So divorce happens to be a very kind of emotional trauma that, that appears to have a really bad effect on people. We also know that children of, uh, of divorces live five years less. And so the kids are really affected. And um, they also have more drama in their lives, more difficulty in their lives, more trouble with relationship in their life. So divorce actually is a very traumatic effect on the adults, but also on the children. Five years off your life is, is a big deal. Plus, kind of much more uh, emotional difficulties throughout their lives for children and much less getting involved in relationships or groups. So it, it really is a big deal. So if we think about marriage as a spiritual path, something you really, really, really want to make succeed and put work into it, you're, you're not only increasing your well-being, but also the well-being of your children. So those are pretty important statistics that we're looking at. So... The lifestyle is what we're talking about. It's a way of life. In yoga, we say sanatana dharma, the natural way of living that takes you to liberation. That's the sanatana dharma. I've written, and I call it the six foundations, sevenfold peace. I'm just going to run through that for a moment. Uh, first, uh, the... 100% vegan, 80% minimum life food diet, fasting for seven days, twice a year, uh, building the prana, the yoga, tai chi, qigong, things like that. Um, that's the second. Third is service and charity. Fourth is meditating, working with uh, groups, and spiritual teachers. Fifth is meditating and prayer. And sixth is as much shaktipat as possible. That's the descent of uh, the spiritual energy to awaken your spiritual energy. That's what we talk about. We will be doing that at 7 in the morning. And tonight at Shabbat, which starts at 4.30 in the, where we're doing it, uh, just in the room around the hall there, uh, where we did yoga this morning, uh, we'll also have Shakti Bhatt. So that's important. Now, the seven... Uh, the sixfold piece and the six foundation and the sevenfold piece, sorry, uh, is similar but not quite the same. So it is peace with the body, 
which we've talked about, peace with the mind, with meditation, and includes peace with the family. So family relationships are very, very important. Now, it doesn't mean everybody has to be perfectly buddies. You have to have the right relationship uh, with your family, whether it's distant or close, that brings peace. That's the key. Uh, clearly, it talks about relationship as the spiritual path as well. The, th uh, the fourth is a peace with the community. Again, community is very agitated in the United States today. What would peace be? Well, peace has the right relationship, so however you're relating to it, you're at peace. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It's a subtlety there. You're just at peace. What it, you've picked a position with the chaos to, it's not bothering you, okay? It still doesn't mean you can't be active. It doesn't mean you don't do charity. It's not what it, okay. And then peace with all the cultures. In Native American, we talk about the rock people, living earth, the plant world, the animal world, and the human world, and all the cultures there. And then sacred ecology, and then peace with God. So we have the sevenfold peace, six foundations. And that's the way of life that we're talking about here. Uh, in, in the big picture. Uh, and time and nature is actually a, a, key, a key thing. Um, even if it's a few minutes. I, mean, well, I, I live in the country up in the mountains, okay? So it's like I'm always in nature. It's very, very, very healthy. You know, vitamin N, nature. So even if you're... In Manhattan, you have got Central Park, you got park. Get in the park, okay? You know, be safe and all that, but you know, walk in nature. It's it's really important to consider in the bigger picture. Okay, so time in nature is very important. And finally, we have the idea of again community. The people who live in community do live longer and are happier and have more support. So you see the community there. Um, and those are really the, the key kind of things you want to want to look at. Uh, sexuality is important, balanced, uh, and the, the, the bottom line is pick a supportive community. Pick a spiritually supportive community. That's Im important. I said a little bit with that for... Women, don't worry. Uh, be happy for men. Worry a little bit. Okay? So those are the, the keys to this whole picture. I'm going to have time for questions and answers. Um, I'm actually just noting. I closed my practice. Now it's me, I'm in a situation where, uh, at least for the next half year, I'm opening my practice to see people and you know, really get the, into the details of this way of life. I can do it over the phone, although I like one time in, 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 one time in person. If you get on the mailing list, you'll kind of see what's going on. I'm giving teachings every single day out on Facebook. Uh, if you get the mailing list, you'll kind of get where that is. We're doing just uh, a lot of my focus is outward, both spiritual and nutritional teachings. I just spoke about heart care the other day. Um, and so all that's happening, and that's kind of what we're doing. The Tree of Life Foundation is the focus, and again, we're doing this work all over the world, but um, I am in the interim, as this is setting up, going to take new patients for about probably six more months. Okay. So, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, any questions? Uh, not when you're going to sleep. Just waking up, you know. If you're, if you're, uh, you know, men with prostate or uh, different things, you may be getting up more at night with age, but you know you want to kind of work on the prostate areas, and uh, the ideal is still not to be getting up at night. Uh, 
So um, when you take Thank a you. bath or you bathe in the water, does that go into your system? And does yes. that affect your body to yes. toxicity? The, the issue we face, showers are better than a bath. I kind of stay out of the oceans and seas and all that. People who can afford it, you can get like a whole filter system for your house. You know, it doesn't, it, we're not talking about 99, but we are talking about eliminating a lot of the toxins that are in the water. And that's the optimal. Hi. You touched briefly on the mitochondria. Where can I find more information about that? Um, I'm gonna, we're going to probably bring it up tonight, but I will give you some key information because it's an important question, so I'm glad you asked it. So longevity is connected to mitochondria life. Uh, the average uh, brain cell has about 5,000 mitochondria per cell. The average heart uh, cell has about 3,500 mitochondria. I am seeing some people that are 200 mitochondria in the brain and, and, and 200 in their heart. What does that mean? Mitochondria are the energy factories of the cell and really of your whole body. When your mitochondria are depleted from toxicity, viral infections, and so forth, you tend to have low energy, and uh, your mind isn't as clear, your ability to protect yourself, in a sense, preventatively against all the oncoming uh, energy, energetic onslaughts, like 5G, is diminished. I have seen a variety of people who, you know, come extremely depleted. And I'm able to check the mitochondria, and I have certain supplements. I have a whole list of supplements, which I'm probably going to share tonight. But there's three key supplements that tend to significantly increase the mitochondria per cell, which is what we're talking about. Healthy mitochondria per cell. One is iodine in the form of aluminine. One is D-ribose. Okay, those are... Two bi big things, and then there's another one. Uh, it's a combination of CoQ10, PQQ, which is very good for the heart, but is super for increasing mitochondria. Those are the three big players. There's lots of other ones, but in all the research I've done, and uh, both clinical research as well, I'm building up, you know, you gotta get sleep, you gotta do this, all the things, but once you're depleted, it's a problem. And our society and all the toxins are depleting our mitochondria function. So most people I see are, you know, maybe 500, 700 per cell. I, I, I like to get people up to close to 5,000 for the brain cells and 3,500 for the heart cells. So they are the key to your uh, vitality. One of the big uh, things that destroy the mitochondria, which again are the energy factors in the cell, are free radicals. So what we're seeing when we think about 5G at a deeper level is it's creating a tremendous amount of free radicals that literally destroy your mitochondria so your mind isn't working as well. You got, uh, you know, with 5G you, you have a significantly increased amount of mental disorders, uh, depression, suicide, um, anxiety, those are all result, they're all connected with lower mitochondria, so the cells aren't working appropriately, so there's lack of harmony. Does that give people kind of an overview? It's really a very important topic, and uh, everything I'm talking about builds your mitochondria. Everything you heard with this is mitochondria. But there, as I say, those three particular nutrients, we do have them obviously at the tree because I've done all the research on it. Um, and so uh, the CoQ10, PQQ, the aluminine, uh, we've seen amazing brain regeneration. But iodine isn't, people think, oh, it's for your thyroid. Well, yeah, but actually it's for your brain. Research shows literally within four months, kids in, in, um, in Indonesia taking uh, iodine increase their IQ in four months, eight points. Mothers who have adequate iodine, their children have a 13 point high, babies, 
13 point higher IQ. It regenerates and builds the brain mitochondria, therefore the brain cells. Uh, iodine also helps your um, ovaries, it helps your uh, adrenals, helps your pancreas, obviously helps your thyroid, helps your skin, um, and is a major player for heart health as well. But as I'm researching and thinking it through, which is what I do, we, there, what's happening is iodine's activating the mitochondria in all those regions. So one of the newer things coming out, I would think, uh, is how do we take care of our mitochondria? One is minimize antioxidant, uh, you know, free radical attacks. And I would also say number four in that is adding a whole bunch of antioxidants. One of the newer ones, not that new, is um, astaxanthin. It's a super duper antioxidant, uh, and it's 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 vegan. So. Anyway, those are, I, I think, keys to understanding it. Does that answer your question? Pretty much. Glad you asked it. I have trouble spelling it. Xantha, Asta, A S T A, Xanthin, X A N T H I N. Now, you can get that stuff at the tree. I'm not here to promote supplements, but obviously, I've done the research and then I go look to see where is the best one. You know, I don't have a particular com company. I just like do the best, do the research, check them all out, see what's going to be best. That's how I go about it. Yes. So, no, thank you. So I appreciate what you're saying. If people want to do stuff against 5G, which is really important not to just let it happen, there's a large demonstration tomorrow all over the country. It's 5G day, right? Yes, and it's if, uh 2.30 in the afternoon on the steps of the main public library in New York City at 42nd Street. So you could zip in there and then come right back out. But it's really important. Thank you. Um, I, I just want you to know I'm working fairly closely with 5G and there are some legal uh, things, liens, that uh, they're just perfecting. It's not quite public, but uh, I think within the next month or two, that uh, people can use these as ways to shutting down the 5G companies. It is really an attack on humanity on multiple levels. It has almost nothing to do with, oh yeah, you can download things faster. It's a military uh, equipment type thing. It affects your mind and uh, literally has been used for mind control for at least 20 years. So there's nothing new about that, but it's uh, we will be talking about it. Um, it's a big deal. I'm not really an expert on that, but it's better to breathe through your nose. Because your nose filters the air, whereas your mouth, it goes right into your lungs. Okay, a few more minutes. Go ahead. I know you said, I know you said something about goji berries was very beneficial. Are you familiar with Dr. Gundry? He's a very, very... Um, pronounced speaker on uh, YouTube, and yes. Um, yes, yes. he talks about that he avoids um, Lugans, Lugans that, uh, he, he doesn't really prefer goji berries, but let me take a question that's actually a little bit more broader. Wait, wait, ask the question, cause, and hold the microphone a little bit away from your mouth, please. Uh, what do you think about applied kinesiology or muscle testing to figure out what exactly does each individual body needs? Um, I think it's very good. Let's get clear. Nothing is 100%. Um, there's electronic testing. There's uh, different levels of applied kinesiology. There's blood test testing. Everything runs about, at best, 85%. And it's in that range. It could be pretty active, depending on the person who knows how to test. And it's very helpful. 
because you can use it on yourself or have a friend do it for you. But the point is, it's, it's up there at, at, at high percentage of accuracy. Any other questions? Yeah. It's kind of the lights make it hard to see out there. One of the points that you made were, <clears throat> one of the bullets that you uh, discussed on the board were setting realistic goals and knowing your limitations. Now, for someone with a low self-esteem or that, you know, has trauma issues or depression, how do you discern whether you're setting a realistic goal or, you know, like how, how do you figure out where... It's you an excellent question. Um, it's a really valid and excellent and important question. This is where group support comes in. And if, if you aren't really trusting yourself, which is for a lot of people the case, being in a supportive group where they can give you external feedback is a very, very helpful way. Or having a teacher, you know, that you trust. So having a group that you trust, helping you access, you know, what's realistic for you is a very good way to go about that for, for the, the situation you're talking about. That's one of the advantages of the of group and group process. Okay, go ahead out there. Okay, hi. <laughs> anyway, when, when you've been away a lot in eating, you get out of balance. And you mentioned that you took s some herbs and, you, and that helped. What herbs did you take? Well, those are particular. The point is, um, you know, when you're traveling and just the act of traveling has an energetic effect. So I took herbs that supported my uh, pancreas function. Okay, yeah, because I travel a lot also, so some, I understand yeah. that when you're, you don't always have the best choices, so as far as food. Well, it wasn't about food, actually, because if okay. I, in my way of doing things, if it's not right, I just don't have to eat. I don't have a problem doing that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I've gone five days without food and water without, no problem. Wow. But, so it's not that option, it's just that the, the Basically, trauma of airplanes and mm. that kind of thing, not those kind of things. Okay. But I look at things, but in my case, I just saw the blood sugar. It's one of my things. I'm monitoring everything. One of my things is the blood sugar needs to be 85 or less. Yes. So if it isn't, I'm going to do what I need to do to fix that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have two minutes. Any other? Okay, there's somebody waving their hand. Hi. Um, regarding maintaining your check, like continually checking levels of stuff, are there any tests that you know of that are valid for checking like your levels of vitamins and minerals? Well, the thing is, we're not average people. We're unique. So, Really, individual testing is going to give you your most accurate statement about that. There are ranges, but those can be a lot. Like, take vitamin D, which really helps support mitochondrial function. Most people don't realize that. But it could be, they say 400, but I, a lot of people need 10,000. There is a big difference. So we need to do more individual testing rather than uh, think you're, you're an average. That's the key. So it's getting time to stop, and I, I just uh, want to say at 4.30, we'll, we'll be having a Shabbat or Shaktipat around the corner there where we did the, uh, at the yoga room. Yoga will be here in the morning, starting at 7 for meditation, yoga at 7.30. Um, and... Those are like the two announcements. Oh, third is I will be teaching Monday morning as well. Okay, so it's good. Uh, 
I leave money. Actually, it's my daughter's birthday and money, so, and she lives in Lower East Side, so I'm going to get to have a, a birthday party with her, so it was good. So I bless all of you that uh, you're inspired to kind of look at all these factors in your life, the six foundations, the sevenfold peace, and bring your lives to an ever higher level of joy and love and spirit. Shalom, shalom.